Oh, hello there. What happenstance that we should chance upon each other in this forest glade? Are you a king of Narnia? You have to watch out in Bitcoin, you know. I think that some Bitcoiners are living in a fantasy. If you saw my last episode, uh, you know that a lot of what's been going on in my show is just figuring out who to be friends with, okay? Who's not crazy? So now that I have a better idea of who's not crazy, I finally felt like I could start thinking like an economist again. So that's what the, this episode is about. When the, the cult took over, there were so many bad ideas. There were so many terrible, terrible ideas. It, it was like, what do you even talk about? So back when all this stuff was going on, I didn't want to think about a block size limit. I just wanted to escape. But now, uh, let's think about it. What does the block size limit really do? It is an arbitrary number uh, that was added in a while back, right? It has no connection to the, uh, the overall Bitcoin economy. And, and, and yet, yet, the core people thought that it was reasonable for this number to somehow uh, determine the future of Bitcoin. It just makes things difficult for the people who actually matter. But now let's talk about why small block Bitcoin is useless as a currency. So what information can't be in the blockchain if there's a limit? You wouldn't want transactions involving small amounts in the blockchain. You'd only want big amounts. Well, I think that the people who are hurt the worst are people who want to take profits. Because a profit is inherently a fraction of a total. And in a mature economy, when things are efficient, profits are small. So people who are efficient and who want to take profits can't do so in the blockchain. The limiting factor is the size of the profit, because you wouldn't put that in the blockchain if it wasn't even worthwhile to redeem later. So you see what I'm saying? There, there need to be three scales. There need to be at least three scales here of uh, Bitcoin amounts. Because the smallest one is the transaction fee, and that has to be small enough for uh, it to be worthwhile to record a, a profit on the blockchain. And then there's the profit, and then there's the revenue, which has to be uh, big compared to profits. And if you can't have all three of them at the same time, then you can't take profits in the blockchain. And what do you lose if you can't take profits? You lose individuality, because what are profits? They're, they're, they're the, the stuff that's yours, that you, could, you get to do whatever you want with. And if your profits are recorded somewhere else, that means that you don't have the same thing that you have with Bitcoin itself. So when there's a block size limit, there are fundamentally two different ways to seek profit. There's the patrician way and the plebeian way. If you're a plebeian, that means you depend on a patrician to have any political power. So if you're a plebeian in the blockchain, that means that you depend on the patrician institutions which can afford to take profits in the blockchain. And your individuality ultimately depends on them. And this necessarily results in two different kinds of behaviors. Because an output in the blockchain is a different good from something that's not an output in the blockchain. Even if it's a token that's backed by bitcoins in some way. And they're different because the tokens can't all be liquidated at the same time. So a block size limit means that there's two different kinds of behaviors. Because there's two different ways to seek profit. So remember what I said in my last episode that Mercer Popescu liked small blocks and he wanted Bitcoin to be for the elite. I was thinking of something that I saw in Craig Wright's A Call to Arms that I didn't mention in my previous episode. There was a part where he said, if Bitcoin fails, then the idea will never be what it was designed to be. There will never be a free, open, hard, and uncontrolled money. Nothing else will replace it. What comes will use the technology, but it will be something else, something monstrous, and something that enslaves, and not something that frees. That is what we have seen in the core cult. Just look at them. 
Their minds have been turned to mush. See, every form of Bitcoin must protect itself. And when you've got a form that doesn't actually work, the only thing it can do to survive is mind control people, because it can't offer any genuine opportunity. But how did this happen? What was the process by which their minds were destroyed? Well, I think it has to do with the two-tier profit system that we discussed earlier. The particular problem with BTC is that there is not a second tier because the lightning network doesn't work. And the inability to seek profits is like having the oxygen shut off. What is profit seeking? Profit seeking is finding reality. That's what a profit is. A profit is you figured out something about reality that other people didn't know. And if you can't do that, I guess that's what happens. You just get a, a sea of insanity. So a block size limit is a way that Bitcoin can enslave people. And I hope we don't learn about too many of the other ways. But as we've seen, a cure for this kind of mental problem is knowing that profit-seeking is important. And there's an important distinction here because there's a difference between profiting in dollars and profiting in bitcoins. You need to profit in bitcoins, but these people only know about profiting in dollars. If you can't profit in bitcoins, then there's no bitcoin economy. So then, uh, so then when I thought of that, I, I was like, uh, well, a hostility to profit-seeking behavior is also something that we have seen in Bitcoin Cash as well. Um, and uh, you know it was just just amazing to me how quickly we started seeing exactly the same problems go on in bitcoin cash uh as were happening in core uh we had uh developers acting like they knew what they were doing once again we have a group of developers who seems to think that it's more important to exert their power over everyone and to maintain that power than it is to grow the Bitcoin economy. And they would rather tell Bitcoiners what they need than figure out what's actually valuable. So, I was, I was thinking, has that, has that been uh, what's been missing this whole time? Because if it is, that, that sure would be really stupid. Because this is going to be one of these things where, uh, where I'm like, why didn't I say that earlier? Because clearly, many people don't get this, right? It's something that seemed so obvious. Why, why would I even have to say it? You have to enable profit-seeking. Profit-seeking is like Bitcoin's motor. How is this not obvious? Bitcoin is an economy, you morons. It, it is it is mostly mostly a future economy we hope right that's the idea so the economies need to have profit seeking that's sort of like the most important thing in it okay if we don't have that we don't have a bitcoin economy what is profit seeking profit seeking is finding reality and that's what the economy is for it's for finding reality okay Profit. Seek profit. Profit is your moral imperative. Somebody who doesn't know that profit seeking in Bitcoin is the moral imperative, they're too stupid to understand Bitcoin. And you gotta keep them away from stuff. They're gonna screw it up, okay? You gotta keep them away from protocol development. Why do you even have to explain that? And don't form a cult this time. You don't have to shun these people. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to bully them. All you have to do is pay slightly less attention to them. Slightly! You don't form a cult this time. Bitcoin needs to be inclusive. It needs to be the most inclusive community ever. Just whistle while you work. And cheerfully together we can tidy up the place. So I'm a merry day. It won't take long when there's a song to help you set the face. I can't believe this stuff you have to explain to Bitcoiners.